Hey everybody, I want to do another problem on buckling and critical load. So, because I've had several of my tutoring students this semester who had final exam questions on this. So I thought it might be helpful for you guys. Okay, so this one's going to come out of the Hibbler book. Again, that's the one I usually teach out of. So 10th edition, it's number 13 out of chapter 13. And what we've got here is we've got this frame. It's got this applied force P here going to the right. Notice we've got pins at B and C. And it tells us to determine the max load P the frame can support without buckling member AB. All right, so here's member AB right here, the vertical one. And we are to assume that AB is made of steel and it's pinned at its ends for Y-axis buckling. And it's gonna be fixed at its ends for X-axis buckling. All right, so it's given you a couple of different scenarios um, here that you have to consider for the buckling, right? You gotta look at Y-axis and you gotta look at X-axis. And then fortunately, make it easier, it gave us the E value for steel and also the yield stress for this steel material. Okay, so let's first figure out what equation we need to start with. Like, what do we need to use for this? Okay, well, we know it's talking about buckling, right? So the, when you think of buckling, the equation that usually pops into everybody's mind is going to be the Euler's formula and that's the PCR equation. All right, so remember PCR is gonna be uh, pi squared times EI over KL squared. And remember this K times L, that is just replacing um, L sub E. All right, so L sub E is the effective length and um, K sub L, or not K sub L, K times L is the equation for the effective length. And the effective length, this is in the textbook, but basically it's how you end up canceling all the moments out of the column. Um, so if you want to know more about that, check into the, your, your textbook. It'll have it in there. Okay, so we've got this equation here. Now remember, PCR, that PCR equation, this is going to tell you the max force we can have in our member without buckling. Let's put that down. So that is an important value to know, right? Because we don't want to go beyond that value because then we're going to have buckling and we will not have met these design specifications. Okay, so I know we're going to use this. Now, in order to be able to use this though, I need to relate this to the force in this member and I also need the relationship with the applied force P. Okay, so I need to kind of relate all of those together. Now, how can we do that? Well, let's think about it. So, I need to know the relationship between this force in member AB and P. So let's start with that first. How can we do that? What about if we use method of joints and we analyze joint A here? Let's see what that gets us. Okay, so we got our joint A, and then we're gonna have our forces, right? So we've got the applied force P, and then we've got member AC and then AB. And I always draw my forces going out of the joint. That way it's easy to tell if it's in tension or compression, All right? Because if we get a negative, it's in compression. We get a positive, it's tension. Makes it real easy. Okay, so we've got these three forces here at joint A, and Let's go ahead and write down this angle. This is at an angle here. Notice this is three, four, so that means this length here is five. So this is just a three, four, five triangle. So we can use that instead of finding the angle. So we've got two basic unknowns here because we're gonna leave everything in terms of P. So I can use my equilibrium equations to solve for AB and AC. All right, so Let's look at that. Okay, so for the x equation, I've got P and then I've got AC. All right, so we're going to have plus P minus, because AC is going to the left, AC, and then I need the x component. All right, now we got the 3, 4, 5 triangle. Remember, the easiest way to figure out the angle with these triangles is you want to pick the side that's parallel to the axis you're looking for and then put it over the hypotenuse. So I want the x component 
3 is parallel to the x, so I'm going to do 3 over 5. Okay, so that's going to give me um, my angle that I need there. And then we want to set that equal to 0. All right, so with this, I can solve, and AC is going to be 5 thirds times P. Okay, so that's AC. And then let's go ahead and find the Y component here. All right, and this will let us find AB. Okay, we didn't really need this AC when I just found it out of habit. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the Y components. I've got AB and then AC. Actually, I changed my mind. I do need AC because i got to use it for this one. All right, so we got negative AB and then minus AC. Now we want the Y component. So what should our fraction be? It's going to be 4 over 5, right? Because the 4 is parallel to the Y axis, and then we put it over the hypotenuse. Set that to 0. Now I know what AC is, though, right? It's 5 thirds P. So we can plug this in. So we did need this after all, right? There I was thinking we didn't need it. Okay, so now we've got this. Plug it in. Um, if you notice, the fives are going to cancel, right? So you get 4 thirds times P. Okay, we move it over. This becomes positive, but we still have this negative, right? So we're going to have negative 4 thirds P. Okay, so now we've got that. This indicates compression because it's negative. The positive here indicates tension. Okay, so now we've got that information. So now we've got the relationship between the force in the member and the applied force, P. Good information to have. Now I'm going to be able to use this with this PCR equation to get the answer we need. All right, but before we do that, let's go ahead and let's find I. We need to know the moment of inertia. Notice it's telling us to look at y-axis buckling and x-axis buckling. So we're going to look at um, inertia on the y-axis and the x-axis. So let's look at the x-axis first. And remember, here's our cross-sectional area. Okay. So this is just a rectangle. So for the x-axis, you're going to have 1 12th base times height cubed. So it's 1 12th. And notice these are millimeters. I want to put them in meters because I don't usually like dealing with millimeters. Um, so the base here would be the 50. So it's 0.05 meters. And then the height is going to be 100 millimeters or 0.1 meters. And then cube that. All right, and then you're going to get a tiny little number. You get 4.167 times 10 to the negative 6 meters to the fourth. So that's moment of inertia about the x-axis. Now we need to look at the y-axis. So for the y-axis, remember, you're going to have 1 12th height times base cubed. So you just flip the base and the height. So now we get 1 12th times 0.1 meters times 0 0.05 meters cubed. And that one is going to be 1.042 uh, times 10 to the negative 6 meters to the fourth. OK, so now we've got our moments of inertia that we need. And then we've got. Um, our PCR equation that we can use. So now this K value right here, this is going to change based on what situation you're looking at. Because remember, it said that we were going to assume AB is pinned at the ends for y-axis buckling, and it's going to be fixed at its ends for x-axis buckling. OK, so that means that little K value will change based on which scenario we have. So let's write down what that will be. So we got the Y buckling. So it's pinned. All right, so if we look, let's look at this little table. This is the Hibbler book. So if you don't have the Hibbler book, any book you have should have these. 
you're going to have this little k count constant and it depends on what scenario we have okay so we're told that we need to have pinned ends for this scenario so k would be one okay and then in the other scenario it tells us we're going to have fixed ends so that would be the 0.5 okay so that's where i'm getting the one and the 0.5 is just from you know that book um, so k is going to be one because pinned ends and then for the x-axis buckling, k is going to be 0.5 because fixed ends. All right, so now I've got that. And then now what we can do is we can look at the PCR value for each of the scenarios, right? The y-axis buckling and the x-axis buckling. So that's what we're going to do next. So let's do x first. All right, so PCR is going to be pi squared times E. E was given as 200 gigapascal. I want to convert it over to Pascal, so that's going to be times 10 to the ninth. And then I need um, I. So I for the x-axis is going to be the 4.167 times 10 to the negative 6 meters to the fourth. And then we're going to put that over KL squared. All right, so K is going to be 1. Whoops, this is X, right? K is going to be 0.5. I wrote that one in a different order. And then L, what would L be? L is going to be 6, right? Because that's the length of that member. And then we square that quantity. All right, so simplify all of this, we get 914, and that's going to be kilonewtons. All right, so now we've got that. Remember, this is meters here. All right, one more thing. I put the kilonewtons first, but actually, when you do the actual calculation, you get this. Um, number here. So you get 913,925 and this is newtons. All right, so then when you convert over to kilonewtons, it's 914. Just so we're all clear there on that. Okay, and then let's do the y-axis buckling scenario. So we want to find PCR for this. All right, so we got pi squared, the 200 times 10 to the ninth. And remember Pascal is newton per square meter. Um, and then we're going to have I about the y-axis, so that's 1.042 times 10 to the negative 6, that's meters to the fourth, and then put that over the KL squared. K this time, though, is going to be 1, right? Because now we have pinned ends. So we're going to have 1 times 6 meters and then square that. So when you simplify all of this, you get 57,134 newtons. So if you put that in kilonewtons, you get 57.13 kilonewtons. All right, so now I've got this. So what, what do we want to do with that? Well, remember, we want the maximum load P that we can have and not have buckling about the x-axis or the y-axis, right? So we have to choose one of these values to use. All right, so let's think about it. Which one should we use? Should we use this bigger value or the smaller value? Well, I'm thinking we should use this value here. All right, so this is the limiting value. All right, because once we exceed this force right here, the 57.13 kilonewtons, we've got buckling about the y-axis. So could we ever get to a point where we had 914 kilonewtons for P the PCR? No, right? Because we will have already had buckling about the y-axis. So this value right here is the one that's going to kind of limit our equation. Okay, so we want to use this one. All right, so now what do we do with that to find P? Well, if this is the max force that we can have in member AB, then it would make sense that we would set AB equal to PCR, right? And then we'll be able to solve. 
So AB is right here, so 4 thirds P. We're not going to worry about the negative sign because that's just telling us it's in compression. We just need the magnitude of the force. So we can do 4 thirds P equals 57.13 kilonewtons. All right, and then you can go ahead and solve. So what would P be then? All right, so if you calculate that, you get 42.8 kilonewtons. All right, so this would be our max applied force P that we could have. And that will be without causing buckling. About either axis. Okay, so there we have that. And as always, you want to make sure that Euler's formula is okay to use here. So remember, for Euler's equation to be okay here, we have to have a critical stress less than the yield stress. So let's check that. All right, so critical stress, that equation is just going to be uh, P over A. It's actually PCR over A. Okay, so we'll have the um, 57... 1,134 over the area. So this is the area of our member. So if we look up here, cross-sectional area is 50 by 100. Switch it over to meters. So 0 0.05 times 0 0.1. It's meters squared, and this is newtons. Um, so what is that going to be? Let's calculate it. Okay, so that is going to be... Um, 1.14 times 10 to the seventh, and that is Pascal, all right? So let's put it in megapascal. So divide through by um, 10 to the sixth, and that's gonna give us um, basically 11.4 megapascal. All right, and the reason why I put it in megapascal is because this yield stress here was in megapascal. All right, so for the steel, yield stress is 360 megapascal. So obviously 11.4 is less than 360. So yes, this result is okay. All right. So that's kind of how you can do this problem when you have a frame, something like this, um, and you have to look at the y-axis and the x-axis. All right, so hopefully that makes sense and you enjoyed that one. I will see you guys next time.